Hello again. Welcome back. In the last part of this lecture, we had a look at a very complex piece of chemical plant, an oil refinery. We saw that it had a vast amount of different processes, separation processes at atmospheric pressure and vacuum conditions, catalytic processes, hydrodesulfurization, isomerization, cracking, and blending processes. A very challenging industry to work in because refineries have very strict products to make from a very variable raw material. We're going to zoom out even further now because we're going to have an introduction to integrated petrochemical sites. These are vast sites containing many, many, many plants of which a refinery may or may not be part of. And we're going to start off by looking at a site that's very close to my heart, which is a site that involves synthesis gas. I remember first starting at a site that processed synthesis gas when I was a young engineer in the early 1920s. In those days, we made synthesis gas from coal. Latterly, as I retired, we moved over to making synthesis gas from methane. It was a lot cleaner and a lot more cost effective. During the course of my career on this site, I saw many, many things. I worked in ammonia production, fertilizer production, explosives production, and also in safety, because one of the processes that was pioneered on this site made plexiglass or perspex, a replacement to glass that is polymer in origin. One of the intermediate chemicals required for that, however, was hydrogen cyanide. And part of my responsibility was ensuring that the cyanide plants were kept safe at all times. So let's start off by looking at what synthesis gas is, you youngsters might call it syngas, and what raw materials are needed to try and make it. So here on my blackboard, I'm going to put two diagrams up. One involves a process called gasification. This is where we take a solid like coal or biomass, perhaps in your era, and we partially combust it, not fully combust it, to produce synthesis gas, which is a mixture of hydrogen and carbon monoxide. The site I worked on at ICI Billingham started off by gasifying coal into synthesis gas. Synthesis gas went by a far more common name back then, which was simply town's gas. The ICI Billingham works was centrally a big town's gas works, and domestically town's gas was piped into people's houses and used for cookers and ovens and lighting. Imagine the safety implications of that in your society. Hydrogen and carbon monoxide being pumped into people's homes for use. Imagine what happens when that goes wrong. However, as I've retired, we were using steam reforming of methane to make synthesis gas, a far cleaner, more energy efficient process compared to coal gasification. The site I would like to look at is located in the northeast of England. It's around the town of Middlesbrough. So I'm going to zoom in a little bit. You can see here the River Tees. South of the River Tees, you have Middlesbrough and north of the River Tees you have the Billingham complex which is where these sites were made. So this whole area has a massive industrial heritage. From 1875 onwards Middlesbrough had 96 blast furnaces making iron and steel. The reason why? Close by there is a ready supply of ironstone in the North Yorkshire Moors. Also from County Durham there is a ready supply of coal easy to train in was limestone from the limestone bearing areas of the Yorkshire Dales and maybe even the Peak District. And so by the time chemicals production was a thing to do, the end of the Great War, there had already been a long established history of industry in this area. And the first ammonia production site was opened here in 1918, just after the Great War, that massive catastrophe ended. So. We had raw, mineral, raw materials available to us. Not only did we have coal, but we had other things as well. We had potash, which is one of the essential components in fertilizers. We also had something called anhydrite. You all know this as anhydrous gypsum, anhydrous calcium sulfate. In fact, the Billingham complex sits atop a massive anhydrite mine. After, long after I'd retired, the mine closed, and by that point, there were over 200 miles of tunnels in this subterranean complex. And hydrite, as we'll see, was very important in the production of sulfuric acid. The River Tees is a very important artery for these chemical and steel works because not only does it allow things like iron ore to be floated up the river and steel and iron to be floated down the river, 
It allows large items of plant equipment to be fabricated and moved into place on site. We could do it by train, but river access was far better. I believe in your era you have things called lorries, but I do believe that if you put a very large distillation column on a lorry and try and go round a roundabout, you have great problems. And so river access is a very useful conduit to the successful, successful construction of a large plant. Also here was a huge rail infrastructure dating back to the Victorian period. So again, we could easily get products in and products out. Because of the steel industry, there was also a huge industrial workforce ready and available to employ on these chemical works. At its peak, tens of thousands of people were employed, 30,000 on Billingham alone. And Billingham, latterly, was one of just three chemicals production sites in this area. All three of these sites were linked together by underground pipelines to make this area one of the world's largest chemicals production areas. Here's a picture of the works I used to work at just at the point of my retirement. I retired quite late in 1970. But here you can see the remains of the coal gasification plant with its big chimneys. This was being superseded by steam methane reforming, a far cleaner way of making synthesis gas. You can see a couple of old cooling towers in the background and a few distillation columns as well. Here is another shot across the Billingham Works and it gives you an idea of sort of the industrial ecosystem that you would see here. Mile upon mile upon mile of plant interconnected together with pipes and conveyors and overhead tramways. Quite an astounding sight and one if you visit this area today that you just simply will not see. Chemical plant, yes you will see, but nothing on the scale of what it used to be. So. I'd like to describe a little bit about the Billingham site to you. So here on the blackboard I have a zoomed in map of the North and South Billingham areas. The South Billingham area is the Castle Works and that was a very different production area to the North Billingham site. So starting in North Billingham, initially we had coal and we gasified it to make synthesis gas. Latterly this is where we also built methane reformers. That synthesis gas was piped to ammonia plants which first made hydrogen and then combine that hydrogen with nitrogen in the harbour process to make ammonia. Now, the synthesis gas was also used to make methanol. If we think what methanol is, it's a one carbon alcohol, and if we think about what synthesis gas is, it's carbon monoxide and hydrogen, we can see with the right catalysis we should be able to make methanol from synthesis gas. Now on my list here, raw materials are in orange, and intermediates are in white, so we can see that both methanol and ammonia are intermediate chemicals. Nearby there is a cement works. This might seem somewhat strange, but don't forget Billingham sat atop an anhydrite mine, calcium sulphate. Now traditionally calcium carbonate is roasted to make calcium oxide, which then is fed into cement, but in this case calcium sulphate was roasted, giving off sulphur dioxide, yielding calcium oxide for the cement works and yielding sulphur dioxide for us chemical engineers to make into sulfuric acid. So cement there on my list is in blue which means it's a finished product. Sulfuric acid is in white because it's an intermediate. So that sulfuric acid was combined with ammonia to make ammonium sulphate, a valuable fertilizer. So synthetic fertilizer production was one of the mainstays of this chemical site. Not on my diagram also, though, is nitric acid production. We also used to make ammonium nitrate, a fertiliser, but also a very potent explosive. Ammonia was used elsewhere as well. Latterly, when we had a source of methane, ammonia was combined with methane to make hydrogen cyanide, a truly terrifying chemical species to have on a production site. But we used to make tens, if not hundreds of thousands of tonnes a year of hydrogen cyanide, and then very quickly use it, because we didn't want to keep it lying around the place. And we used it by reacting it with acetone and sulfuric acid to make acetone cyanohydrin. Acetone cyanohydrin is a building block of a monomer, methyl methacrylate, and that's what the methanol got used for. So acetone cyanohydrin with the methanol gave us methyl methacrylate and a byproduct of ammonium sulfate, yet more fertilizer. That methyl methacrylate was then transported to another works up in the Pennines in Darwin and there polymethyl methacrylate perspex or plexiglass was made and so we can see that from just coal and anhydrite 
and methane, we can make a vast array of important industrial chemicals that result in consumer-facing products, cement, fertiliser, perspex. So a few key points for you. I've introduced to you something called an integrated chemical site. An integrated chemical site takes raw materials all the way through what we term their value chain to the finished consumer-facing product. On integrated chemical sites you will see many, many plants connected to each other, connected by pipeline or conveyor, sharing heat, sometimes sharing other utilities such as compressed air or cooling water. We've seen that chemicals production by necessity sometimes has to have hazardous intermediate chemicals, ammonia, sulfuric acid, hydrogen cyanide. Safety on these sites is of most paramount importance. You do not want people not to be able to go home at the end of a shift. We can see that synthesis gas is an important precursor to many industrial chemicals and it's one of the most important branches of the chemical industry. I haven't had time or opportunity to talk about synthesis gas being made into long chain hydrocarbons via fischer tropsch catalysis, but that is also another important use of synthesis gas that you should be aware of.